And now, stand up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe. It's time to stand up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, do curtains only need dry cleaning when used by two previous apartment tenants? And with the American Music Award winners announced, will MC Cardi B receive the recognition she deserves and also puberty? And now, the podcast host who wields a machete only when he's reenacting Romancing the Stone, (laughs) Pete Dominic! Yes, that's true, and I'm going to clear-cut a path behind my house to take walks in the woods with my dog. So, there is that occasion I'll use a machete as well, and I do have one, but I'm not telling you where it is, Pete. Oh, have I got a treat for you today, ladies and gentlemen. You're getting your money's worth if you pay. If you don't, sign up now for a paid subscription. Go to StandUpWithPete.com. A special, special episode of Stand Up today because I bring together two of the most respected scientists in their field of climate and COVID. I've got Dr. Michael Mann and Dr. Peter Hotez, who had a mutual respect for one another. I invited them to come on together, and they met each other for the first time virtually on this podcast. Now we are cooking with something that it makes it faster to cook with. Anyway, very excited about this interview. It is just a, a great idea. I, and this one was mine. I actually thought of this idea. I thought both these guys are great and we can talk about the anti-science movement that they have been in the middle of in, in terms of being the targets of of. So great conversations. Very happy to have you joining me here on the podcast today. It's Tuesday. Thank you for listening yesterday. And whenever you do, go to standupwithpete.com right now to subscribe. Welcome to new subscribers. I'll give you shout outs later this week, but we need more. Can we get a few more this week? I know it's Thanksgiving week and you're probably listening to a lot of podcasts because you might be in the car traveling somewhere for Thanksgiving. So it's actually It's actually a busy time for radio and and audio podcasts and production. So excited to have you, new listeners. Subscribe to the podcast right now if you haven't already. It is Thanksgiving week. I hope that you are planning something fun, maybe relaxing, although it's not really the word that you think of when you think of Thanksgiving, but hopefully taking some time off from your normal routine and maybe being with some loved ones. Val and I are taking the girls up to my parents in Syracuse. And it's supposed to be snowy, and I'm getting in shape for skiing. I'm very excited. I've got goals. I hope you do as well. All right. Well, let me get to the news as I do each and every day here at the top of the show, which is why it's a great show to subscribe to daily because I give you a hell of a news recap in a way that nobody else can. And I know there's millions of podcasts out there, but nobody does it like me each and every day. Tell your friends. All right, it's time for a look at the last 24 hours in news. We call it, guess what, the last 24. (laughs) All right, lots to talk about on today's show. Pfizer says its vaccine is 100% effective in adolescence. Jeff Bezos is donating $100 million to the Obama Foundation. President Joe Biden has picked Jerome Powell to be the Fed chief. He's named Lal Brainerd to second in command at the U.S. Central Bank. And the Democratic-led House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, the ongoing coup, as I call it, has issued five new subpoenas to several Trump allies, including Roger Stone, Spokesman Taylor Butowich and InfoWars founder Alex Jones, which made big news yesterday. And NASA announced that it's going to crash a spacecraft into an asteroid to redirect its path. And it's uh, launching that mission this week. So that's going to be pretty exciting to watch. Is there any way we could put Ted Cruz on that spacecraft? Speaking of which, yesterday, Steve Schmidt, who's got Plenty of skeletons in his own closet, controversy in his own life. But he was on MSNBC yesterday, and he was criticizing Ted Cruz. Nicole Wallace asked him about it, because Ted Cruz was on CBS's Face the Nation the day before doing some election denial, big lie stuff. And I just thought this was such a great rant. I wanted to start with it. Here is Steve Schmidt on Ted Cruz. Well, this is a historically despicable 
person, Nicole. Um, he ranks right up there with Joe McCarthy. He's a demagogue. He's a liar. He is as irresponsible a United States senator as there has ever been in the history of the United States. He arrived in the Senate and has been a vandal towards our institutions and towards the idea of the truth and delivering it to the American people. So, again, it's all nonsense that he's spouting out of his mouth. Again, we have a real life autocratic movement in this country. Two elements in order to sustain one are the cynicism of its elites. Men like Ted Cruz, who've had every advantage, every opportunity, graduate of the most elite institutions in the country, like Harvard Law School, who believe they can ride the Trump tiger, that they can play its supporters for fools, that they can benefit and accrete power to themselves. Um, so when you look at somebody like Ted Cruz, you know he's lying. Everybody knows he's, knows he's lying. Ted Cruz knows he's lying. Um, but extraordinary cynicism, coupled with the type of propaganda and uh, that comes out of Fox News and, and the right wing, can turn that nonsense into reality. And so Ted Cruz helped incite the January 6 attacks with his lying, um, with his instigations. He was, of course, revving up the crowd there. Uh, that morning, and he has sought to whitewash it uh, with more lying for many, many months. He is a truly despicable figure at a moment of real crisis. History will judge him very, very harshly should American democracy prevail in the years of fight that lie ahead between this extremist movement that is gaining strength, not decreasing in strength. All right, Steve Schmidt on MSNBC absolutely excoriating the horrific Senator Ted Cruz of Texas. Also yesterday, Vice President Kamala Harris announced the Biden administration will be investing $1.5 billion from the coronavirus aid package to address the health care worker shortage in undeserved communities. Also na- announced the, uh, the the gap has closed in vaccination rates with underserved and high risk communities. Here is the vice president, Kamala Harris, yesterday. Employers offered pay time off. Child care providers offered drop in services. Public transit agencies offered free rides to vaccination sites. Churches and barbershops opened their doors to become vaccination sites. And as a result of all of that work today, as Dr. Murthy, Dr. Padilla have discussed, as a result of all that work today, we have effectively closed the gap in vaccination rates among black and brown adults. Now, to be sure, there is still work to do to end this pandemic. And speaking of the pandemic and COVID, I thought this clip was great from Deadline White House yesterday when Nicole Wallace had expert Dr. Vin Gupta on to examine some of the latest COVID news. There's a story that just moved on the New York Times website. Dr. Olsterholm, who's often on this program and others, is quoted as saying this about COVID. This thing is no longer just throwing curveballs at us. It's throwing 210 mile an hour curveballs at us. That's Dr. Olsterholm. He said the virus has repeatedly defied predictions and continues to do so. Let me just show our viewers um, where things are right now. Cases are up 29 percent in the last two weeks. Hospitalizations are up 6 percent. In the last two weeks, deaths are down 9%, still coming down from the Delta surge. But I, I want to understand your recommendations for the holiday. The Times article says that despite cases ticking up and in some places being higher than they've been since the spring, everyone is going back to normal. Is that what we should be doing? Good afternoon, Nicole. Great to see you. I, absolutely. I think it's OK. If you are 18 and older, you've got your two shot series, getting a booster if you haven't already, you can get near immediate benefit from, from that, Nicole, within, say, 48 hours. That's when that booster starts to take effect. 50 and older, vital you get that booster as quickly as possible for 18 and up. You should still get it. Uh, the point here is that if that's you and you've gotten boosted, it is absolutely safe to travel. An airplane cabin, I say this is a pulmonologist, it's one of the safest places you can be around other people, fully masked. Air exchanges of the entire air circulation every two minutes, 100 percent of that air. So traveling by airplane to your end destination, making sure everybody's boosted. And, and they took proper precautions and route. Absolutely safe to gather indoors, unmasked with others that are doing the same thing. I'll lastly, just say for everybody out there, since people want uh, uh, actionable advice here, know your body. 
know your body, know your symptom profile. If you're developing a, a, a head cold, if you have a sore throat, get tested, get tested before you travel. I like, I tell all my patients and anybody that asks, if you haven't already in the last 20 months, get an oximeter or something that measures your oxygen level in the cold. And also just speak to your provider if you have any of those symptoms, because now we're going to soon have oral antivirals. So really nobody should die from this pandemic um, because we have such great tools, both vaccines and therapeutics. Well, there you go, Dr. Ven Gupta on MSNBC yesterday. Now, also making some headlines didn't really want to play these clips but i thought they were pretty interesting uh, it is uh, president trump's former lawyer and consigliere and handler michael cohen hours after he released he was released from house arrest he went out uh, on the, in front of the the apartment uh, building that he lives in and made an announcement and then he went over to cnn's newsroom and chatted with allison camarada but here he is he was sentenced to three years in prison in december t- uh, 2018 pleaded guilty to crimes including campaigns, finance violations, tax evasion, and lying to Congress. I will not cease my commitment to law enforcement. I will continue to provide information, testimony, documents, and my full cooperation on all ongoing investigations to ensure that others are held responsible for their dirty deeds and that no one is ever believed to be above the law. I guess then he jumped in a car and headed up to CNN, where he sat down with my old friend Allison Camerata and had this to say. Explained it. Um, but I do want to make this promise to you and to all of your viewers that I may have been prosecuted. And right now I am the only one, but I will not be the only one at the end of the for this crime, for this crime and for others. Who else will be prosecuted? Well, for the money I'm going to leave that to the district attorney and to the attorney general to continue their investigations and continue their. Um, but right I mean, who else cases. was involved? Well, there were quite a few people that were involved. Uh, Eric, in, uh, Eric Trump was involved. Obviously, Alan Weisselberg was already under indictment. Don Jr., Ivanka. Uh, there were a slew of people that were involved in this. I was certainly not alone. This wasn't a one on one conversation with Donald. It was a um, it was a much bigger group. Let's just let's just leave it at that. All right. One more clip from Michael Cohen with Allison Camerata, which I think is worth sharing because I'm here. And well, why not? So you ha- you believe that you have provided actual receipts, actual evidence of crimes being done? Or did you just sort of directionally point them in the right? Or a combination of both. A combination of both. That's that's what you think that you have. Mm -hmm. And you still, as you sit here today, believe that Donald Trump will be indicted for something. I do. And what do you think he will be indicted for? Again, I can't say uh, I don't want to get into the sum and substance of the investigation uh, other than to say that they are working very hard. And they're working on a daily basis in terms of bringing this indictment. And again, your, your point is very well taken. And it's one of the reasons I made the statement that I did um, today when I left the 500 Pearl Street, that I will continue to cooperate and I will continue to provide more documents and information. All right. Well, trigger alert. I'm going to play Donald Trump. Seven seconds of Donald Trump talking to this idiot asshole, Mark Levin on Fox News. And I'm only playing it because this is Trump owning himself. Listen to this. <laughs> and the good news is Jimmy Carter is a very happy man because he's no longer going down as the worst president in history. Well, he was talking, of course, about Joe Biden, but we all know he really is talking about himself and may not even realize it. Oh, and he also said gas costs seven dollars and fifty cents in California because who cares about anything remotely true anymore? Uh Gasoline was one dollar and eighty seven cents. That was a year ago. And now it's I guess just hit seven dollars and fifty cents in California. The rest to follow. And I predicted this. I OK, nobody cares. Well, we do care about what's going on with racial injustice in this country as a result of people like Donald Trump and his policies, beliefs and speeches, whether it's Kyle Rittenhouse trial or the trial for those who murdered Ahmad Arbery which it was in closing arguments, again, not touching those today, only because I can't really produce robust segments uh, for them. And there's some really good stuff out there with The New York Times and, and other local media outlets. But nonetheless, here is the great Eddie Gloud yesterday on MSNBC, perfectly articulating the moment that we are in right now. Right. I mean, look, we have to describe the elements within our country for what they are, right? And, and, and what we're seeing here is not only the exploitation of fear, 
We're seeing that fear mobilized to menace others, to beat them into submission, right? To threaten them into submission. This is the drumbeat of fascism, and I'm not being hyperbolic here. The illiberal elements of American life have always danced with, right, this ugly underbelly, this ugly underside of the modern West, where those who believe that their vision of the world must obtain, and they're willing to do anything to make it so. And they're defined not only as that violence, Nicole, that menace is not only directed toward others that look like me, or who have a different sexual orientation, who are women, who are immigrants or the like, but it's also directed at those who would dare to ally themselves with the possibility of this new world. And here we are, right? In the middle of the battle. In the middle of the battle. So well put by Eddie Gloud. Love that guy. A national treasure. Another national treasure is Heather McGee. She also had com- made comments on Chris Hayes' show All In on MSNBC last night that I don't think need too much context or, or set up. Here's the great Heather McGee, author of The Sum of Us. That's exactly right. I mean, what we're seeing right now is self-interested elites spending billions of dollars broadly in the media and social media and in politics. And they're trying to teach Americans who think of themselves as white to reject democracy and the rule of law, to reject mm. these sort of common norms if they have to share democracy with Americans of color. There's a lot of evidence about that. But as we think about this evidence that we keep seeing stack up, right, the backsliding that you spoke about at the top, as we think about all this evidence, my question has been, throughout our history, who wins when democracy is defeated, right? Who wins when property owners' rights are held above the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everyday people, right? It is always the self-interested elites who are vying right now for the hearts and minds of white Americans. And they're saying reject democracy. And the problem is, Chris, they're winning in the Republican Party, right? A study by Larry Bartel shows that the majority of Republicans think that the, the traditional American way of life is disappearing so fast, right? This is demographic change, that we may have to use force to save it. A plurality thinks that patriotic Americans are going to have to take the law into their own hands. And this study was done and fielded before the big lie became the sort of common right. sense on the right. All right. Great commentary from both Eddie Cloud and Heather McGee. And now let's go to my old friend Joe Madison, a.k.a. the Black Eagle on Urban View, Sirius XM. Joe Madison, a legend in broadcasting. Well, apparently I didn't know this, but he's been on a hunger strike for two weeks. Joe is always doing all kinds of really important publicity stunts in ways and I'm not minimizing and I think these things are important to do in this case Joe's trying to bring attention to the fact that the only thing that really matters right now in Congress and in America legislatively is to get the Voting Rights Act renewed and pass these voting and voter rights laws in Congress here is Joe Madison explaining it himself and I'll try to get him on the show in the next couple of days This is my statement. While President Biden and the Senate prepare to enjoy their Thanksgiving recess with their family and friends, I will continue my hunger strike as the country celebrates how much to appreciate. I hope that each senator repeat. I hope that each senator will reflect on how much we have to lose. If our voting rights aren't protected, therefore, I encourage the Senate upon their return to Washington to immediately convene and pass a bill that will protect our voting rights. And I close with this one thought. Thanksgiving. After all, is a word of action. There you go. A word of action and a man of action, a mentor and a friend to me at Sirius. And I reached out to him to ask him to join me to talk about that. Always a great conversation when we get the the legend Joe Madison on. So looking forward to having him on the podcast for the first time. And finally, in terms of audio that I've got for you, want to just this is a it's a pretty big and important story that. President Biden yesterday announced that Jerome Powell would stay at as the chairman of the Federal Reserve, preserving the continuity there. Uh, President Joe Biden selected him for a second term as chair and elevated uh, this woman, Lal Brannard, to vice chair as the 
U.S. Central Bank grapples with the fastest inflation in three decades and the lingering effects of COVID-19. Here's just a brief clip of President Biden yesterday making the announcement. I'm nominating Jerome Powell for a second term as chair of the Federal Reserve. And I'm, non, I'm, nom, I'm nominating Lael Brainerd to take the position as vice chair of the Federal Reserve. When our country was hemorrhaging jobs last year and there was panic in our financial markets, Jay's steady and decisive leadership helped to stabilize markets and put our economy on track to a robust recovery. Jay is a believer in the benefits of what economists call maximum employment. Well, Chris Hayes had Nobel Prize winning economist, New York Times columnist Paul Krugman on to ask um, Paul Krugman about that. Here are his thoughts on that appointment or reappointment. Right now, the pandemic has created a ton of lingering economic uncertainty, including the largest increase in inflation in over 30 years. And so many consider renominating Jerome Powell to be a controversial move, even though it does represent continuity in very tumultuous times. Paul Krugman's a Nobel Prize winning economist, opinion columnist from the New York Times, where he writes about macroeconomics and policy. And he joins me now. And, you know, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on Powell, because I've seen arguments in a million different directions about whether this was the right way to go. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting. I mean, the choice was between a, a monetary dove who thinks that inflation is probably transitory and is reluctant to raise rates and a monetary dove who thinks that inflation is probably transitory and reluctant to. I mean, there really wasn't very much air between Jay Powell and Lael Brainerd, who was the uh, the other uh, likely choice uh, on this. And so in terms of the issues that seem likely right now, it just doesn't look like there's a big deal. Yes, uh, Powell is a Republican or was a Republican. I think you know, he's rational and, and that almost makes him not a Republican now. Um, but in terms of his actual policy stance, he's pretty much in line with a lot of the Democratic Party. It, it's not clear that there was a uh, a crucial policy issue at stake here. And Biden probably just didn't want to fight on this particular front. All right. One more clip from Paul Krugman on MSNBC last night when Chris Hayes asked him about how Jerome Powell handed handled the pandemic. Yeah, the, the, the uh, his response. I mean, we had we came amazingly close to a real financial meltdown in, in March of last year. And Powell just threw an enormous amount of money at it. He basically responded extremely aggressively. And he has been very much in the camp that says, look, uh, inflation might be a problem, but let's not rush. We've, we've made that mistake too often of, of choking off an economic recovery before it really gets a chance to improve people's lives. And so I think it's very, very hard for anybody um, to for progressives to have a complaint there. He does have a history that the Fed does regulate banks. It has a it plays a role to some extent on other fronts. And and Powell has not always been what the people on the center left would have wanted there. But it's not clear that, first of all, that that that's really what's crucial now. And second, that that Powell is still the person who was maybe a little bit slower on that front than you might have wanted 10 years ago. Yeah, um, we should say Elizabeth Warren has come out against him and says that it's no secret yeah. I oppose his renomination. I will vote against him. And then she cites this. His failure in regulation, climate and ethics makes a still vacant position of vice chair of supervision critically, critically important. Vice chair of supervision uh, is that more specifically regulatory uh, role. But there, there's also the question about, like, what next? Right. And this big, you know, we have inflation. It is high. It's the highest yeah. it's been in 30 years. Um People don't like it. I mean, I think there's a certain amount of kind of, you know, there's there's a whipping up into a frenzy about it. The media is partly doing, but also people can tell when things cost more and they don't like it. And this huge question before us, which is, does it persist? If so, for how long and what the Fed does about it? How are you thinking about that? OK, I mean, this the this is a hard one. I mean, this is this is very different. The inflation fears of you know 10 years ago were, were clearly silly. This time, yeah, this is this is a this is a tougher one. Um, the best bet still. I mean, we have not, in fact, had massive spending in this economy. Uh, spending has been not all that high relative to past trends. But what we've had is all of these constraints, uh, constraints of you know clogged ports and insufficient warehouse space, and and then also the Great Resignation. A lot of people reluctant to go back to jobs, and nobody knows how long that lasts. Um, there's a balancing of risks. There is the risk that inflation can become embedded 
that it'd be hard to get rid of. Uh, but on the other hand, there's the risk that, look, the, you know, the American rescue plan, the, the, the big spending is, is receding in the rearview mirror now. And if you tighten, you might be tightening just at the moment when the economy actually is going to start to falter. So, uh, you want people who are alert, who are willing. I mean, I, I don't I think the odds are that by this time next year, we'll be saying, what was all that about? Why were yeah. people so worried about inflation? But we don't know that. And but you want smart people at the Fed who are alert to the possibilities. Well, there you go. That's all the sound I've gathered for you on today's last 24. But there are there is, of course, more news that I wanted to get to, as there is every day. But don't have the time to get into all the details. OK, that's why I call this the news dump rapid fire headlines. And here is a brand new jingle from the great voiceover artist, musician and actor Pete Co. out in San Francisco with a pleasant family friendly Thanksgiving inspired jingle. Deep frying turkey man hazard creating chump. He set his legs ablaze for today's news dump. Oh dear. <laughs> Wait, wow, why is there why is there a tiny cat involved? That's a little bit disconcerting and confused. By the way, Pete Co is going to apparently take the rest of the week off, which comes as a surprise to me, but here is uh, just behind the scenes, our, our conversation about that uh, on the Marco Polo app where you go back and forth with each other. Hey, hey, you got your dump and your intro all uploaded. Um, I'm going to be out for the next few days. Just to give you a heads up. So the rest of the week, Wednesday, starting Wednesday, can't do it. Just to let you know. Have a good one. Uh Thank you for letting me know, but as you know, all time off requests need to go through HR, so I think you should probably tell them. You don't have HR. It's just you. Is was HR like Q or something? <laughs> yeah, Pete's just an awesome guy, listener, talented, and loves to do the the jingles doesn't actually work for me. Okay. Well, here are those headlines. Let's get to it. Well, I guess it was about 20 years ago that Thanksgiving, the holiday season started to creep into actual Thanksgiving day when retailers began kicking off sales into the wee hours of the morning on Black Friday. 10 years later, Target and other major stores opened their doors on the holiday itself, creating a new shopping tradition because you can't make enough money if you're a giant company like Target. Well, they announced that they're no longer going to open their stores on Thanksgiving Day this year, making a permanent shift to the unofficial start of the holiday season that was suspended during the pandemic. Still waiting to see if other major retailers will follow suit, such as Walmart and, and others. Macy's will not open its stores on Thanksgiving for the second year in a row. Well, last year was a pandemic. Coles and Walmart will also be closed, apparently, on Thursday. But Walmart hasn't made a decision on the future of Thanksgiving Day store shopping. Friday, of course, is a big online shopping day. For the past two years, the holiday trailed only Cyber Monday and Black Friday in online stores, according uh, to Adobe Digital Economy Index, whatever the hell that is. I, I should say Thursday will still be a big online shopping day, not Friday. Of course, Friday is. And a NASA astronaut named Jessica Watkins will be the first black woman on the International Space Station crew. She's joining the SpaceX Crew 4 mission for her historic first trip to space. To become the first black woman to embark on a long-duration mission at the space station where she'll live and conduct research in the microgravity laboratory as it orbits Earth. This will be her first journey to space since becoming an astronaut in 2017, and she's scheduled to lift off in April 2022 from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Hey, let's take a look at October home sales because they hit the fastest pace since January. Sales of previously occupied U.S. homes ticked higher in October, marking their strongest pace since January, even as resilient demand and competition for relatively few properties in the market kept prices climbing. Alex Vega at the Associated Press writes, and I like this story. Climate change isn't what's driving some U.S. coal-fired power plants to shut down. It's the expense of stricter pollution controls 
on their wastewater. Dozens of plants nationwide plan to stop burning coal this decade to comply with the more stringent federal wastewater guidelines, according to state regulatory filings, as the industry continues moving away from planet-warming fossil fuel to make electricity. That's right, coal-fired power plants to close after a new wastewater rule. And this is good government, in my opinion, protecting what is in the public's interest and the interest of the our natural environment. Come on, son. About time. I saw this headline over at Bloomberg. Apple accelerates work on car project aiming for fully autonomous vehicle. Apple's pushing to accelerate development of its electric car and is refocusing the project around self-driving, full self-driving capabilities, according to people familiar with the matter, aiming to solve a technical challenge that has bedeviled the auto industry. How about that? The Apple car will soon be a reality? Soon? What do I know? I'm not reading the rest of the article. This is the news dump. And federal officials said Monday they're seeking more than $160,000 in fines from eight airline passengers over incidents involving alcohol. So be warned. The Federal Aviation Administration said the biggest single proposed fines, topping $40,000, involves a passenger who brought alcohol on the plane, drank it, smoked marijuana in the laboratory, and assaulted, sexually assaulted a flight attendant on a Southwest Airlines jet in April. That'll cost you $40,000, asshole. I like it. All right, that is your news dump for today, Tuesday, the 22nd, 23rd, rather, of November. Now it's time for my very special conversation with two of the most respected scientists in their field. Dr. Michael Mann is a climate scientist at Penn State. Dr. Peter Hotez is a vaccine expert, virologist, at Baylor University. They both have a lot of other responsibilities, titles. They've both written several books. They're both on TV all the time. You can learn more about both of their biographies and credentials in the show notes. But trust me, they're the best, which is why I'm very excited to have them on together. This is my idea. I thought, hey, both these guys are always on media, on TV, writing and talking about what they know best. And They're also being attacked for it. They are being attacked because they are scientists and there's an anti-science movement underway in case you didn't notice it. So I wanted to talk about that with them and join them, have them join together. They never met and this is the first time they both had mutual respect for each other, knew of each other's work. As you can tell, really, uh, they're both very familiar with it. But this is the first time that they had met, at least virtually, and I was very excited to host them in this conversation. You'll notice the first time Peter Hotez speaks, by the way, his microphone's touched a crap app, but I just told him to get a little closer, and that fixed it. Don't fret. Audio was pretty good. I was very happy with the conversation, and you should follow both of them and let them know that you, you heard them and here on the show. I'll post the video on youtube.com slash stand up ASAP at Peter Hotez at Michael E. Mann. Here we go. Okay. Well, I've got Dr. Peter Hotez and Dr. Michael Mann. They, they are meeting each other virtually for the first time. And this is super exciting for me, for the podcast and for our community. And I just want to start by thanking you both I've been interviewing both of you. I've gotten to know both of you well and become really friendly with both of you. And I just appreciate how generous you have been to me with your time and and educating me and my audience over the years. Thank you both so much for all of your time. And I'm so glad to have you both here. Well, thank you. And just I'm going to just say a word about Michael. Michael, even though we haven't met you virtually or in person, you've been a huge supporter and and source of support because you know, the, as a as a climate change scientist, you endured the first wave of ag- political aggression. And so I've learned so much from you because I've been dealing it with for 20 years, but never at this level. So the anti-vaccine aggression has now reached the climate change aggression. And so learning from you and, and getting advice, I can't tell you how appreciative I've, I've been in my family, too. Well, that's very kind of you, uh, Peter, and right back at you. And, you know, I, I do feel like we are sort of brothers in arms here. And so it's wonderful to actually finally come come face to face and to do so with our with our good friend, Pete. Um, so Absolutely. I'm looking forward to, looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I don't even really need to be here. I kind of just want to hear you guys uh, talk to each other about your experiences, because the subject that we're talking about, the common theme here between climate science and and vaccine technology and, and, and virus the science is an ideologically motivated anti-science campaign 
to create denial and skepticism and, and so much more. And Michael, as Peter said, you've been in the trenches for a long time dealing with these players. And I guess before you, you'd probably talk about uh, the tobacco industry in their campaign. How, how similar is the criticism, is the attack? And, and where, where would you start on the attack on science in, in modern day America? Yeah, well, thanks, Pete. I mean, it, it is something that has been going on for decades and it didn't start with, you know, COVID-19 and it didn't start with climate change. It started decades ago, uh, as you allude to, for example, with tobacco, where the findings of science came, you know, uh, found themselves on a collision course with some powerful vested interests. And in that case, it was the tobacco industry. And, you know, we've heard this story so many times now, um, their own internal scientists knew about the deadly nature of their product. Uh, they knew that uh, it was highly addictive uh, and their re internal reports were buried. And instead, the tobacco industry, as we all know, engaged in a decades long effort to discredit the independent science that came to the same conclusions as their own scientists. Rather than coming forward and owning up to the problem, they invested tens of millions of dollars in a massive disinformation campaign. And the fossil fuel industry has run with that same playbook. It's the same story. ExxonMobil, the world's largest publicly held fossil fuel company back in the early 1980s, successfully predicted how warm the planet would be today if we continued with business as usual burning of fossil fuels. And in their own internal reports that were ultimately leaked to the public, they referred to the consequences as catastrophic. That's not Al Gore. That's not Michael Mann. That's ExxonMobil's own scientists. But right. what did they do? They doubled down in a campaign to discredit the science and to lead us all astray. And then and then I think from from the from the anti-vaccine side, it started somewhat independently. But now there's been a convergence and a confluence. So it was, you know, in the modern form, the anti-vaccine movement was very much around false claims of links between vaccines and autism. And I spent years going up against this. And I wrote a book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, about my daughter. And people have spoken about this before, um, even pre-pandemic. I think the game changer started around the 2010s, where I think they were the anti-vaccine movement was losing ground or losing uh, um, influence. And so they became a political movement. They, they be, got themselves adopted by the Republican Tea Party the far right and far other far right wing elements in the United States. And it really accelerated first year in Texas where, where I am. And so I watched this whole thing unfold with the formation of political empty political action committees, acts and and then of course then COVID nineteen it all really accelerated and and you're seeing this far right uh, aggression. I don't even call it misinformation or disinformation. Right. And, Peter, let me uh, let me just stop you. If you could pull that mic up a little closer to you, I think I'm I'm losing you a little bit. If you can, yeah. So yeah, you were saying you, you don't you don't call it you call it aggression. Is that what you said? Yeah, I call it anti science aggression, and it's uh, and because it's, it's to, I think to just call it misinformation or disinformation sort of kind of trivializes it or makes it sound like it's no 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 biggie, no big deal, and. It, and this is part of a larger, clearly a far right authoritarian movement that's targeting the science and the scientists. And, and it's, it's got organization. It's got money. It's it's able to cultivate its, its own collection or bullpen of uh, contrarian intellectuals or pseudo intellectuals. And so I'm looking around at are there other examples of this? Is this totally new with the vaccines? And then I came across Michael's writing about about climate change. I said, this is, this is yeah. going by a similar playbook. And, yeah. and I even trace it back to what, what Stalin did during the thirties, you know, that is part of a way to exert authoritarian rule. You had to discredit the science and scientists. So it's actually, this goes back almost a hundred years to. to Lysenkoism. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And they, and they allowed thousands of Soviet peasants to die because of this fake vernalization theory. Um, and and work to discredit the science and scientists and insert their own pseudo intellectuals in place. I said, this is what's happening now. And, Peter, and they some jailed deadly science. consequences. And this is <laughs> they jailed. That's science. right. They sent them to, well, at least they haven't sent me to the they, they haven't sent me to the gulag yet. But, no, uh, not yet. Um, but we'll we'll see. But 
but I, but the thing that I were, the thing that gets me the most exercise is this is no longer a theoretical or ethereal discussion. It's, it's now a killer. I calculate between starting in June one in my state of Texas, where anti-science aggression is at its worst, 20,000 unvaccinated Texans since June one this year or the last five months or so, six months have unnecessarily lost their lives to COVID-19. They are, we were, they are 20,000 Texans who were defiant of getting vaccination vaccinations who felt that to be allegiant have show allegiance to whatever this thing is whether it's authoritarianism or the far right or what some used to call the republican party is now the leading killer of young people in the state of texas that that's how awful this has gotten and this is why i'm so outspoken and this is why i you know taking inspiration from michael you know the endure the the pushback not and not only from the bad guys but also you know, from my colleagues who say, you know, Peter, you know, you're not supposed to talk about Republicans and Democrats or conservatives or liberals. You know, you're supposed to be you're not supposed to be political. Well, I'm not being political. Those guys are being political. I'm just saying the anti-science doesn't belong in the politics. Yeah. But, you know, I just haven't figured out a way to talk about it without talking about it. Yeah. You know, Peter, as I like to say, we didn't come to the politics. The politics came to us. Yeah. yeah. We didn't choose to, to have the science politicized in this way, weaponized in this way. What, is it, right. what does it mean for both of you when you hear that phrase, uh, pol- you're politicizing the science, stop politicizing the science? Don't, I mean, there, there are disagreements amongst your colleagues and yourselves. The, there are all kinds of issues when it comes to research and funding and, and so on. But when, what, do, what do you hear when you hear that, when you're saying either stop politicizing the science yourself or you're being accused of, of politicizing the science, Michael. Yeah, you know, again, I say I didn't come to the politics. The politics came to me. You know, the hockey stick curve when we published it uh, more than two decades ago was inconvenient to some powerful special interests because it laid bare the the profound impact that we're having on the climate, the unprecedented warming that is taking place due to fossil fuel burning. And I found myself under assault, much in the way that uh, Peter finds his way uh, himself under assault today uh, by, again, ideologically motivated forces of anti-science, in many cases weaponized by, you know, a Republican Party that realizes that they can, you know, uh, drum up support for their agenda by throwing out the this red meat, by portraying scientists like Peter and myself as villains. It's a way ultimately for these special interests to weaponize a large sector of the population for their purpose. There's no natural reason that Republicans should want to die, but they've elected to do so by ignoring uh, the public health messaging by people like Peter. And here's the thing that is playing out on an accelerated time frame. We're able to see almost in real time the deadly nature of ideologically motivated anti-science. With climate change, even more lives will ultimately ultimately be lost if we fail to act. But in a sense, we've been provided with this sort of accelerated analogy that allows us to talk about, you know, how ignoring what scientists have to say can be deadly. And, you know, every Hollywood film, dystopian Hollywood film, you know, supposedly, you know, starts out with somebody ignoring a scientist. That's the old adage. Well, that's literally what's happening with these twin crises that are playing out. And and the result is deadly and disastrous, ultimately, for us and the planet. What would you uh, say, Peter, the same you know, question? Yeah, I mean, no, can... anti-science is now the leading killer of young people in the United States. And then I can back it up with real numbers. We have the numbers out of Texas from the Institute for Health Metrics and, and numbers on the number of percentage unvaccinated. It's all, it's all there for anyone to look at. And, and so where are the sources? The sources are coming from three or four sources that I can easily identify. One, members of the, of the U.S. Congress, extraordinary as it is. And you heard it from Representative Taylor Green, who calls vaccinators brown shirts, or she calls them Nazi vaccinators. Or what's well, that guy, uh, Cawthorn, who says, first, they're going to vaccinate you, and then they're going to take away your guns and your Bibles. And as ridiculous as that sounds to us, there's a segment of the population who believes there. And we have two senators that are actively promoting an anti-vaccine agenda, Rand Paul and 
and Senator Johnson from Wisconsin. Then you have it all amplified on the conservative news outlets. Yep. I mean, you watch Fox News anchors at night and some of the other conservative news channels, and they go after me. I had Laura Ingram and the governor of Florida go after me the other day, and I'm like, why's the governor of Florida going? I mean, I took the kids to Disney World once. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> oh, like, my that's God. A, I mean, I'm a pro- medical school professor in Texas. Why is the guy? So, and so that's, that's really damaging. But the third, and for me, one of the most troubling, are somehow they've co-opted very important professors at Harvard and Stanford and and places like that and these far right think tanks that have, you know, they and they're very clever. They'll take these facts and factoids and string them together to create an entirely false narrative. And in the, well, un- unfortunately, what happens is a lot of the news anchors and journalists, um, reporters, you know, they don't know the subject in as much depth as I do. So they can't debunk it right there on camera. So it sounds floor, right. uh, plausible. But that's let's just tell both that, sides. Let's just yeah, tell let's or sides. tell both sides. And and that is that is scary. I mean, what what drives people to say such knowingly false things about vaccines and, and covid? I mean, that that's really true. Well, you mentioned you mentioned Congress, then the right wing media atmosphere, certain people in Congress and then certain people in, in, in academia. I'm not sure if you you know, what, what order you would put it in. But I, I think it all starts with, with media and then politicians and even academics pick up on it and, and run with it. But it's it's often about, you know, the most obvious thing, which is making money, dividing people, getting ratings. So, and and that's the one I understand the most myself because I've been well, working we've with seen people. This, and Pete, we've seen this for decades, right? With the tobacco wars, with climate change, uh, you put enough money out there, you can buy off uh, people with uh, impressive sounding credentials. Yeah. And I'll just tell the story of Frederick Seitz, who was the president of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, the, basically, the and he, highest he was president of Rockefeller University. Rockefeller I University. Where I did my PhD. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it, and he was a theoretical physicist um, in the field of condensed matter physics, which is where I actually got my start. So it's sort of interesting, these connections. But what's most relevant is the way he sold out. Um, he was offered millions of dollars uh, from uh, an organization called the George Marshall Institute, which was a front group for fossil fuel interests. And he was paid literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to attack any science that was inconvenient to them. And and, and that, of course, included uh, climate science. He uh, ended up, in fact, signing his name to an article It was just a I mean, it was just something they wrote up. It wasn't a real scientific article, but it was formatted to look like it was in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it was a bunch of cranks denying that climate change was real. This was formatted to look like, you know, a prestigious publication of the the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and sent out to hundreds of thousands of scientists um, and all that money that was fossil fuel money that was behind all that. So, yeah, they can always find bad actors who are willing to sell out. And I'm not even sure it's always for money. I get the sense that and there's people reach my age and our age and and, <laughs> and some people just get desperate for relevance, right. relevancy right. and are willing to talk themselves into God knows what. And um, and that's, and, that's right. And people make a big fuss over them and they go on high, you know. Um, well, so I think it, that's a component. When it of comes it to commonality here, the commonality, people come into it. People allow themselves to be weaponized for various reasons. It could be money. It can be just sort of the you're late in your career and this is a way to suddenly get back on the main stage um, and have a large audience. There are any number of reasons that a scientist can allow themselves to be used in that way. The commonality is that there are millions of dollars to broadcast that message, right, um, the, right. the echo chamber that, that uses that to advance an agenda. And that's, that's industry money. And it is a small number of players, relatively small number of players, as Peter note, notes, you know, the Murdoch media empire, that's Rupert Murdoch, the, um, you know, the Koch brothers, uh, now just the Koch brother, uh, the SCAFE foundations, right wing foundations. There is this ecosystem, but it's it's funded by a relatively small number of bad actors. So when it comes to uh, just another question that's perfect for both of you, I think. You are you both have two of the most impressive resumes in, in academia and, and, and science. I can't even talk about the things that your resumes say. That's how dumb I am. But but th- that's what makes me so 
frustrated as as someone in the media trying to ask you guys questions, trying to find answers, trying to critical thinking is I did my own research, gentlemen. I've done my own research on vaccines. I've done my own research on climate and I conducted it here from my shed with a keyboard in an you internet a degree from the University of Google. Don't I you? have a degree from Google University and AOL yeah. State. And yeah. I, I, gentlemen, am an expert here. What, what do you how do you talk to people? How can you convince people that while you appreciate them looking in the things and, 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 quote, doing their own research, it's not the same, Peter, as having uh, years of experience, many degrees and most importantly, practicing science yourself all the time. What's the difference? How do we tell those people they don't necessarily need to do their own science? They need to be able to trust people like you guys. Well, you know, as I say, it's not even like they're doing their own research. They did right. a not even a Google search anymore. Google has done done a little better now at trying to filter out some of the stuff. They did a Yahoo or uh, other other search, which still, you know, if you put my name into it, still has me as public enemy number one or the original gangster villain, as they call me. Um, so yeah, I think I saw so an image of you drinking the, the blood of children. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm so it's sorry for laughing at it's that. Thing we, it's the thing we do. Um, so so that's the first thing. And, and I try to look at them as themselves victims, right? They're victims of this this weaponized health communication or weaponized science communication or anti-science aggression. And and it's tough. It depends how far down the rabbit hole they've gone. Um, and and, you know, if you can get enough time with them, usually you can talk them into getting vaccinated. But I think the thing that troubles me the most now is. The way we're seeing elected officials talk or now even the sports figures, right? You heard it from, you know, Aaron Rodgers and, and other other people right, like yeah. that, not to, not to single out Aaron Rodgers. He's not alone on this. But, you know, what they'll uh, and even, you know, what you'll hear is sometimes they'll even say they got vaccinated or, you know, they, they're they not anti-vaccine. So when someone says they're not anti-vaccine, that bells and whistles go off. That's like the guy who says it's not about the money and it's, you know, it's all right, about the right. money. Right. So they'll say, I'm not anti-vaccine, but then they'll say everyone has their freedom of choice to make their own decisions. And that's the language. This comes out of this health freedom movement that accelerated in Texas in the early 2010s. And that's the reason given for it. So this is how it's become politicized as a far right movement uh, linked to this health freedom. It's all bullshit, but it's um, and that's what you need. And so that's when I call out the NFL and the NBA and 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 our elected officials don't say that when you say that that creates that false equivalency again it's either health freedom and ivermectin or getting vaccines and it's not that way it's only vaccines that are going to save your life Michael what about you would do your own research because you know a few years back there was this there was this research project done that a lot of us I think re- relied on and we're we're pretty uh, depressed by that research showed that with certain segment of population, even when you give them all of the arguments, all that, they, not only do they not ch- have their minds changed, they're not enlightened, they actually dig in even deeper. Well, recently, apparently, that science has been debunked. It's not necessarily the case. So maybe we can convince those people who are really dug in on, on issues that are around climate, around COVID. What do you say to people who say, I've done my own research, and, and how do you convince those people that are really, really already convinced against what all the science and data that you have? Yeah, I mean, you have to at some point distinguish between those who do see this entirely through uh, an ideological lens. It's part of the tribal identity of being a conservative today is to deny the basic public health science now uh, of COVID-19 and to deny the the science of climate change, or at least to deny that it's a problem that we need to deal with. It's sort of hard to deny that it's happening now because people can can see the catastrophic uh, consequences. But there's still an effort to deny that it's really a problem that we need to do something about. And, um, you know, the... So if somebody is so dug in their, uh, you know, the, with their in their heels, uh, uh, you know, in in rejecting the science, um, probably the last person that they want to hear from is an ivory towered, pointy headed scientist like myself. And so it's important to have a variety of trusted messengers that can speak to different audiences. And you have people, for example, in the national security community or in the business world or evangelical Christians who are sometimes effective with those audiences because they're part of that tribe and they have more street cred in talking to them. Um, 
So at some point you have to say, all right, I'm not the best person to be talking to this particular audience, but you know, I would suggest that you invite so so and so to 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 speak with them. And then I tend to focus my efforts on what I call the confused middle. These aren't people who are ideologically opposed to the science, um, but they are caught in the crossfire. They're victims of the misinformation and the disinformation. And with some knowledge and especially with some resources, they can be brought along from sort of, again, that 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 confused, uncommitted sort of middle category. We can move them into the engaged category because we don't need to win over the entire public. That's never going to happen in our tremendously d- divided um, you know, politics that we have here today in the United States. But we can get enough people on board to advance reasonable policy action. And we're sort of seeing that, I think, on COVID-19. I'm interested in Peter's thoughts. We're making progress, but much more slowly than we should have because of that that disinformation campaign. Yeah, the problem is this. You know, we're, you know, we're reaching now about 60% of the U.S. population fully vaccinated, although soon that's going to mean three doses of the mRNA vaccine. But I think we'll address that. I think the the problem is we need to get to about 85% of the U.S. population, not the adult population, the entire U.S. population. That's a quarter of the country. And let's face it, we got a quarter of the country, you know, deeply dug in on far-right conspiracy theories. And that's going to be the toughest part of trying to identify Republican or whatever we call this party now, the far-right leaders that can finally understand that this is so self-defeating and 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 wiping out the lives of so many people. And it's been tough to find those individuals. Peter, just a, a question. You know, we, we will ultimately reach herd immunity one way or the other, right? And so at this point, it's it's a question of how we reach it. Well, well I'm not so sure now, no. because when you look at what's happening with people who are infected and recovered, if they do not get vaccinated, they the rate of reinfection is at least twice as high yeah. as those who do get, vac- yeah. get vaccinated. Afterwards, so it's not as all that durable as people like to make it yeah. out to be. The yeah. Delta variant, which in itself is an anti-vaccine talking point now, and and you know they they look at the study coming out of Israel that has some big issues uh, with it, but no, so I don't really even yeah. include those infected individuals and recovered as contributing to that herd immunity. Maybe a little bit, but it's short-lived, and and you're at high risk of getting that Delta variant, which is so highly transmissible. Yeah. And it's about to happen again. I mean, this next big winter wave looks pretty bad to me. It's already happening in Michigan and the upper Midwest and and, and Minnesota in Pennsylvania. and Wisconsin. And yeah, and it's yeah. going to, you know, Mother Nature's not being coy here. She told us she's going to give us a big summer wave across the South in 2021 because she did that in 2020 and she did. And now she's telling us once again what she's going to do. And when you only have, if you have 40% of the country unvaccinated, that's still a lot of warm water for Hurricane Delta to pass over. So right. we're in for some t- terrible times, I think, one, once again. Well put. Well put. You have referenced, uh, I think, just as metaphors, three times Dr. Mann's expertise. He just asked you a question. Do you, do you have a question about uh, with him about whether or not we're going to continue to have winters in the future or if it's really, uh, the, oh, you mentioned Hurricane Delta, real hurricanes. I mean, how do you two know, you two respect each other. How do you, as experts, vet out other experts when you see them in media or elsewhere? How, how can we, you know, who aren't experts know who to trust? Because that seems to be the issue that we're having now that we are questioning. You know, there's some bad scientists. Sometimes there's some bad science and then science is not perfect. And so when you get something wrong and then you later correct it, given new data and you change it, you're then indicted as being, you know, some kind of a criminal when in fact you're just conducting science. How do you know who to trust how can we know who to trust peter well sometimes it can it's and sometimes people are very clever almost to the point of being diabolical and how they mask it but one of the things that i have found in in the contrarian intellectuals or pseudo intellectuals is if you disagree with them and you and you try to explain why they're why their thinking is flawed on this they immediately become very aggressive they've got a very short fuse mm-hmm. and and they get pretty angry and they start bringing in other people and they start to gang tackle. So that to me is always a, 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 a red, a red flare that, that there's something else going on. 
What about you, Peter? Uh, Michael, how do you know, you know, who to trust or, or not, you know, not necessarily yeah. think much about? So if you're a scientist, you know that the things to look at are, you know, are they actually doing the down in the trenches work? Are they just talking heads or are they actually doing the science? In Peter's case, I believe you've used uh, right. you've written a widely used textbook about this stuff. You, you know, publish in the peer reviewed literature, you know, you, you know, he's been developing coronavirus vaccines for 10 years. And so. Right. Right. I mean, you're doing the actual work. And so he's not just talking the talk. He's walking the walk when it comes to the basic underlying science. To me, that's, you know, what what gives me so much uh, respect for, for Peter and, and makes me listen to him very carefully, because this is a public health threat to me and my family. And, and I need reliable information. And I know when Peter appears you know, on MSNBC that I can trust what he's saying. Now, I'm a scientist, so it's it's pretty easy for me to sort of navigate those treacherous waters, much more difficult for the general public, because as Peter sure. says, um, the, the, the forces of misinformation are very skilled at using the language of co-opting the language of science, the lexicon, the, the jargon, and attaching impressive sounding titles to themselves that don't actually stand up to scrutiny, but to the person on the street, make them sound like, hey, there's somebody to be listened to. And as Peter also alluded to, the media isn't always our friend here. Um, right. This is less and less true with climate change, uh, but it's still true to some extent. And it's certainly true when it comes to uh, coronavirus. There's this tendency to treat contrarians who represent a fringe movement and, and, and not mainstream consensus science to, to put them on an equal footing when it comes to how we litigate this um, in, 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 you know, um, on, on television and in the media. And so there really is responsibility uh, on the part of journalists to not fall victim to this sort of journalism 101 idea that you need to you have two people on the stage with opposing viewpoints. Right. That's not the way it works in science. There aren't two equally credible views when it comes to the reality of climate change or the public health threat, uh, you know, that we face in COVID-19. And there, and there are certain catchphrases that they use that, you know, you have to head for the hills when you hear it. If someone says the science isn't settled, just 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 go. <laughs> just the it's like the horror movie where the voice goes, get out, just go. <laughs> <laughs> the um, sound sound science is another one of those uh Right, right. I like to use the word consensus as much as possible. I, I feel like that's a more convincing argument uh, or at least word to use but they, they you know they 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 actually try to co-opt that as well though they'll say oh yeah those scientists are just holding hands around a campfire singing kumbaya you know we can't trust yeah. them it's a conspiracy and, and the consensus just indicates that the conspiracy is deeper right. and wider as far as they are concerned where is that campfire that you guys meet and, <laughs> and hold hands? So you both are pretty well known now because of your media appearances. I think, you know, as I turn to solutions here at, at, towards the end of our conversation, uh, it, it's about educating people. It's about communicating in a way that we can understand. You're both excellent communicators. You're both scientists. You're both highly respected in your fields. And you're both making television appearances and appearances on all types of media, which is, I think, super important. People then, and I've seen this over and over with both of you, accuse you of all kinds of things, of trying to get rich and famous and all of that. I am so glad that both of you make all of these immediate appearances. It's so helpful. I love to see you on TV, radio, whatever, read your, your Twitter timelines. What, what do you, you know, what do you say to those people in terms of why you make these television appearances, Peter? It's, it's how many uh, Rolls Royce do you have? How many islands do you do you live on Peter Hotez? Yeah, I mean, I've never taken money from CNN or MSNBC or any podcast except for the couple of million that you're going to send me after this. Um, but <laughs> but but other than that, you it's know. all in bow ties. <laughs> yeah, so I don't take money for media appearances, and you know, I'm a salaried professor at the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas Children's Hospital. It's, you know, it's a good salary, and I'm. I've been able to put four kids through three, three of my four kids through college, except for my special needs daughter. And, and Anne says we might even pay off my first mortgage at the age of 63 next year. So <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. So I'm not, no, I'm not complaining, but I don't take money. We don't take money from the pharma companies. What is interesting, though, is how the aggression from the anti-vaccine community, the far right, is all about the money, right? That's they're assuming they just it must be because I'm getting paid and this kind of stuff. 
and because that's what they're all about. They're all yeah. about the grift and all about the money. Yeah. So, you know what, the projection. way people criticize you as self is very, very telling. It's a bitch yeah. projection. Yeah. Same, same question for you, Michael. Why, you know, you're, uh, you're doing this all for nefarious reasons. You've yeah, written. absolutely. As Peter says, this is projection, right? And it's very clever. It's sort of Karl Rove politics of, you know, accusing your opponent of the very thing that you are guilty of as a way of both tarring them and immunizing yourself. Because, of course, you know, I, I don't drive a Maserati uh, like uh, Joe Manchin. Um, mm. I don't make lots of money from coal investments that allows me to to drive a, around in a, a, a Maserati. And like Peter, you know, I, I don't live a, an extravagant uh, lifestyle. I do OK. But if I really wanted to get rich, what I would be doing was working for the fossil fuel industry and attacking scientists like myself. Right. I would right, renounce right. all of my science and I would go around using my credentials to attack other scientists. Uh, I would make a lot of money doing that, but I would be destroying the planet um, and I wouldn't be able to live with myself. And frankly, I don't know how some of these people do, but that's sort of where it is. And by the way, we talk about this at great peril, peril not only because, you know, I get the emails that the Army of Patriots is going to hunt me yeah. down and. I don't know why you need an army of patriots. As I say, it's just me and Anne and Rachel and the cat. I think one or two patriots. <laughs> you know. But but the other side to that is, you know, I'm more worried about what my colleagues think because again, it's not polite, or you're not supposed to talk about Republicans and Democrats, liberals or conservatives. And I remember, you know, when um, when Trump in in March last year was really at rolling out the disinformation campaign. You know, COVID was a hoax. It was the flu, hydroxychloroquine, uh, the hospital admissions for ketchup and elective surgeries. I remember, you know, you know, Anne, you know, my wife, who's usually the one because I'm usually sort of the unfiltered one. Anne is the really conservative one who holds me back from saying this and that. She looked Same at me. Here. She, she, <laughs> said, she said, look, you know, you don't want you, you know, you have to say something because if you don't six months from now, you're going to realize all this lost lives. You'll feel terrible if right. you don't. So that's all I needed to hear. And I just let it rip. But the hard part was the silence from the professional and scientific societies. And in some cases, even the national academies were silent. So I was really out there. And that was the scariest part for me. That wasn't not the words of the enemies, but the silence of the friends. That was that was the hardest part. And now it's better. Now people are coming to my side. And so so I feel more comfortable doing it. But there were some rough times out there. Here's the thing, Peter. I think, you know, our, our colleagues, there was a time when, yes, you know, the era of Carl Sagan, you were vilified by some of your fellow scientists for becoming a popularizer. It was unbecoming of a scientist to do that's that. That's why Carl Sagan got the night tenure at Harvard, because that, um, that's right. You wanted that, to go no, to Cornell for that. That's absolutely right. And he was blackballed from the National Academy of Sciences, despite having done, you know, critical work that uh, should earn anybody admission to the National Academy. But uh, there was this sort of uh, he was a pariah um, in some scientific circles because he was a communicator and he, he would engage with the public and he would at times take on positions that were political, that had implications for policy. Here's the thing. I think that our colleagues mostly today get it. They understand how politicized science has become. They can recognize anti-science when they see it and they know it's coming from one half of our political spectrum, but they're scared as hell. <laughs> And the silence comes from the terror of, you know, what would happen to me if I were to, you know, to speak out as well. And they see folks like yourself and me and others who are out there become vilified, get attacked, get hauled, you know, into hostile congressional hearings. And I think that's why it's so important uh, for us to continue to what, do what we're doing to show that you can do it, that you you, you can survive the onslaught and Set an example for other scientists who are increasingly are coming out onto the stage. And yeah, I mean, the, I agree, Mike. I mean, the young people, they're, you know, they're, they're all in. They're saying, well, how yeah. do I do this? The problem yeah. is the, the ecosystem of science is not doesn't make it comfortable for you to do it. We yep. still get the message from I mean, our office of science, community, our office of communications un understands it. But most universities, especially academic health centers, they're very risk averse and. They don't want their docs and their scientists speaking out. And or if they do, they, the message that gets sent to them is you do it at your own peril. Um, and certainly, you know, when you get evaluated annually, I get evaluated annually, too. And 
what do they ask me? They ask me about my scientific papers and my grants, right? They, they're not asking me about, you know, public right. communication and, and in any form with even my single author books, they don't ask me about. So the message is that reaching out to the public, communicating with the public about science is not valued. Totally. And in fact, mm. it's, it's um, not even welcome because it potentially puts the institution or it exposed the institution. That's exactly right. It would be easy for me to say that, uh, you know, Baylor University and Penn State benefit from your appearances on media. You're getting their them a lot of publicity. I mean, I think people could easily say that, but you're saying that's not necessarily the case. It's a little bit kind of well, well, no, Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children have been fine. They've been terrific, but a lot of institutions aren't. I mean, I know of I won't name them, but I know of institutions that have actually terminated faculty for speaking out. Um, mm-hmm. That's how bad it is. More some more some of the academic health centers than. Then uh, and especially some of the and I think it's probably worse it's at a place like where you are, Michael, a state university, especially if it's in a place where there's a conservative legislature that oh, has wow. a lot of power. And and and, you know, it, it's funny. I have a my science co-partner at our Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, Mary Elena Batazzi. She's from Honduras and the, the university is called the Autonomous University of Honduras, where <laughs> she got her bachelor's degree. And you had to put the word autonomous in because otherwise you assume that the state would exert unnecessarily right. unnecessary control. And, yeah. and maybe we have to start doing that here. In the yeah. US. Well, uh-huh. you've seen that. Isn't that what we saw, what you're saying? I feel like in Florida recently, uh, the, the Florida governor and, and Republican yeah. legislature muzzled experts in public health experts in government. Do I have that right? Is that what happened? Yeah, we have to create the Universidad Autonoma de Florida. <laughs> right? it's, it's, it's really bad. And, uh, you know, I think what the Sanctus did has been among the most egregious. But, but I think it's happening probably in more subtle ways in a lot of red state, you know, uh, where, where public universities are in red states. Yep. So. And Peter's absolutely right about that. There are few incentives in academia for, uh, you know, for, 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 uh, sort of prioritizing outreach and, and public communication. Um, it isn't considered uh, or is considered very little in the promotion and tenure process. And in fact, you get a lot of grief, especially when you're a state university and there are powerful, you know, vested interests within the state. Um, certainly uh, Pennsylvania has a very powerful natural gas industry and they clearly have a horse in this race and they use their influence in the, in the Republican state house and any way they can to, you know, make it uncomfortable, uh, for example, for a university um, to to support their academics speaking out about issues like climate change that that represent a threat to these very powerful interests. And so you might think that, you know, the university would support having faculty and researchers who are engaged in public outreach. But in many respects, as Peter says, if anything they, in the end, tend to sort of tend to distance themselves from that. Hey, you know, this person's just speaking as an individual. They don't represent the university. They don't represent uh, our interests. It, it, it's, it's sometimes just the opposite of what you would think. And that speaks to the very perverted incentive structure writ large right. when it comes not just to our universities, but our, our society right now. Right. Well, gentlemen, I could talk to you for 10 more hours, but you got to go do science and research. I hope that uh, as a result of you guys uh, finally meeting here, you'll you'll work on a book together or something. And I'll, I'll get a thank Be you awesome. there. But Be awesome. also, more importantly, um, I just want to give uh, our friend Ali Velshi a hard time. You both join him on a regular basis. He's one of the best of the best. Um, but you prefer to at least to look at me, right? Like the question is, am I more <laughs> handsome then MSNBC's Ali Velshi. Michael Mann, you'll have to answer first. Yeah, I mean, just on the hair alone, um, yeah. you know, the facial hair alone gives right. you a, right. a more hirsute sort of right. look right. than you, Ali, who's really just clean, very you bold, know, very all bold. around. Would you agree? I, I, would, I, I don't know. I don't want to betray my brother, Ali. He's, he's that, that's a good looking man there. So <laughs> what are, I'm sorry. What are you are you saying that he you have to have to give an answer? Are you saying that Ali Belshi is is, in fact, better looking than me or? <laughs> no, I think you're both just handsome. You're both just so me. handsome. I that mean, we can't, I, I, I aspire to for, yeah. for the look of both. Yeah, brothers. we just can't. We're, we're just 
Yeah, no, it's uh, and a- Ali, by the way, has been great on, on the climate been, issue. Yeah. And there's some yeah. folks, you know, uh, at, at the major networks who really sure. have tried to showcase this. And, and I would say, yeah, actually, I mean, the truth is, you know, most of the anchors that I've worked with at CNN and MSNBC work hard to get it right. I, yeah. I, I think that's fair to say. And PBS yeah. I, and even, you know, even Fox News hung in there with me for a while. The, the daytime anchors anyway. And then finally, it just got I got too radioactive for them and they cut me sure. off. Do you either either of you brings up one last question. Either of you get in, invitations some from time to time, if not regularly from big right wing corporate media outlet, others that, that want well, to. I've said on? I'll speak to anybody. I've I've spoken on Newsmax. I haven't they haven't invited me on OANN. If Fox News invites me, I, I agree. If uh, I did Daily Caller, I know I mean, because I. And, and for this and for a very practical reason, that 25 percent of the country to get yeah. vaccinated is yeah. what we need to right. do. And and, uh, you know, I've you know I've written to Joe Rogan a couple of times to get back on. He had me on pre pandemic. We never had an issue. And and, you know, he's brought on some guests I'm not been happy with. I said, you know, get me on, Joe, yeah. so I can talk to the yeah. country. Sure. Those are the people I need to reach to agree yeah. to try to get them back. And I just I just want to save lives. I don't want to shame anybody. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Just enlist their help to vaccinate. I'll, it's a great I'll point. Vaccinate. And you might you know, you're not going to get the yield that you might get um, in a more favorable media because you are in dealing with this ideological um, uh, audience. But but if you can win over some of them. That's real progress. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't, uh, you know, more power to Peter for, for doing that. I haven't ventured quite as much into hostile territory as he has. But, you know, when I get invitations to go on Fox News, um, I'll, I'll typically take them because if you can even get a, a neutral interview um, in, in that sort of hostile territory, that's a huge win. Right. And there's some. There's some there are actually some some pretty good people yeah, even and present the face that you're not devil incarnate as, right. as the, the conservative news outlets like to portray us. That's, sometimes. that's really exactly should. right. And I think that alone has some positive value. You really that's should right. just completely give up and dress up as vampires on your next appearances. <laughs> just both of you just wear horns. Well, there are, there are already enough, that, there are enough memes out there that do it. They've done that. For yeah, me. for sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, gentlemen, I cannot thank you enough. What an honor it has been to 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 have both of you on and to just sit back, really, and and listen. To, to I hope to do it again, and I hope other people will will do it as well. It's such an important issue. This this confluence of of issues that both of you have become sadly experts on in terms of dealing with all of these crazies and critics. So, thank you very very much. Keep up the good work and and uh, informing the public on what you guys know best. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. This was very meaningful. I appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. No, thank you. This was a wonderful uh, opportunity, and I look forward to the next one. I want to thank all of my producer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you pay. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Right. You, you pay them in, uh, in milk bone biscuits. Or, she no. just gets biscuits, and she'll edit this <laughs> thing right up. All right. All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, I was holding up my dog there at the end in case you couldn't figure that out. Dr. Peter Hotez, Dr. Michael Mann, so great. Please go thank them on Twitter at Michael E. Mann, at Peter Hotez. That'll mean a lot to me, to them, of course, and they'll probably get back to you. Also, I'll be posting that up ASAP on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash stand up. If you haven't followed, subscribe to my YouTube. If you do any of the the YouTubing, if you go on there, that's great for me. The more subscriptions over there and it's free to subscribe, obviously, the better it is. Write a review on Apple iTunes. Who could bring these two guys together and conduct that type of interview? Nobody. Nobody can. It's I'm the only one. That's it. I should get awards. No, I should just get your uh, your continued listening, I hope. I appreciate you very much. I think you know that. What am I grateful for this year? I'm grateful for you and all the new friends I have. And uh, so supportive over the past couple of years. I cannot thank you enough. I'll keep doing my best. I could put out a great product for you to learn and enjoy from each and every day. Yeah, that's all I've got for you today. Tomorrow, I've got Barry Ritholtz. I've got Kenneth C. Davis coming on this week and some other guests that I'm planning to reach out to, but I don't want to announce yet. So I will be doing shows each and every day as you'll be in the car, maybe with friends and family on the way to friends and family. I want to give you something to listen to, enjoy, and learn along with me each and every day here on Stand Up. 
And now it's time for our Grammy Award winning singer, songwriter, the great John Carroll to take us out with our song. It's time to stand up. Have a great day, everybody. Well, every lost child will finally be found. There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground and then stand up. Stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw the land for all. They had to stand up. They had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball drawing all the plans of stand up. But all If you stand up, stand all right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up, and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up, ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up, show obedience to the voice inside, and listen well and it'll tell you not to run it.